Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. One of the things I always say before we've done these talks before is what I've tried to do is make this like being on the tour bus because when you're on the tour bus with these two after a show, the most amazing stories come out uh, for hours of driving, you know, it's like where, a I, where I just go, it's what? Like, huh? It's like a campfire situation. It is. It's very like it's a campfire in a bus going really fast. Yeah. Down the highway. <clears throat> with so, no seat belts. With no seat belts. <laughs> yeah, there's a, in, in, <laughs> in, yeah. she likes to live dangerously. But uh, did everybody see, this is how I now started, because last week there was quite a Twitter storm from the Washington Post that did a story when Face It came out and uh, there was a Twitter storm and they, everybody made the Washington Post change the, the headline. So, but what was the best thing about it was dictionary.com threw shade at the Washington Post. <clears throat> So this is how I like starting now, um, but we'll get right to it. So I found uh, this photo. Wait, was this your photo? I don't know, because there, uh, it was me and somebody else shooting at that moment. And what year is this, I do you remember? I, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I thought it was you. I, I have the whole series like that, but I don't, know, I don't recognize that one specifically. That might, there was a girl shooting, and I, I don't remember who it oh. was. Oh, well, we'll just say you did it yeah, tonight, it's okay. so. <laughs> Your, but was this yeah. like your first, was this a first Blondie tour there or? It was an early yeah. vi visit. Okay. And we're, who were you playing with, do you Very remember? early on. Uh, I don't know if we were actually playing. We might have been yeah, just no, at the whiskey. Yeah, we came out here to play. That the whiskey? We came here to do the whiskey yeah. that early. I mean, but I don't remember the, the, you know, sequence of events. I knew we did the thing with Tom Petty. And you know, you know, you know Jenny's picture of Debbie in the wedding dress at the whiskey, right? So, and it's got spray paint on it. That was Tom Petty's signature that he wrote on, on the wedding dress with spray paint prior to, and he was opening up for us, which is, yeah, because he, you know, was well, ironic. I think you're in for a treat because uh, every city we go to, they start remembering like these kind of amazing stories from that city and there were I think there's quite a few from Los Angeles there's that will probably come out stuff, yeah. last night we found out that the cocaine that Debbie bought was from San Francisco that <laughs> led to David Bowie showing her his dick that, so that was that was last night you missed that but but Chris specific, specifically wanted to talk about this photo well yeah that's 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 our connection to old Hollywood because yeah. we were we were really lucky that I don't know how we even hooked up with Sam Shaw. Sam Shaw was one of the, we should have, we, we should have whipped out some more of his old shots. He shot all of old Hollywood. He, was, he shot the picture of Marilyn with her dress blowing up from the seven year itch. And he never got any money for it. He got like 200 bucks for the session. And the, you know, the studio. Well, you know, he was a photographer the photographer that would be on the set. Well, he was a set photographer. Yeah, but he, he was would just be there while they were shooting and do the, Master photographer, photographer, just the greatest yeah. stuff. So he shot all of that, and he got, he was hooked up with John Cassavetes, and got Cassavetes to the whiskey. Maybe, maybe he was hired by Chrysalis to Sam? shoot to shoot that movie or be involved with that movie. Uh, uh, um, not initially, no. Yeah, because no. there was this little <clears throat> thing. 
I think Chrysalis that did. he went to Chrysalis with the idea. Yeah. I yeah. Don't, yeah, I don't know the genesis of the whole thing. Anyway, we were did, really lucky to be to meet him and be hooked up with him, and then he introduced us to this uh, screenwriter, Ted Allen, who was another old Hollywood connection. He was uh, nominated for, I think, Lies My Father Told Me. This is the most well-known one, but he wrote a whole series of old, uh, you know, 40s, 50s screenplays. Did he tell you about Marilyn? Did he talk about Marilyn? A little bit. They a little all, bit. They, all these guys, they all love Debbie, you know, and they did, you know, make a connection, which was... Did, was this, okay, so this is what I was thinking. Since he worked for Marilyn and knew her, did you tell him about this dress? Well, I think was this that came after? Later. Oh, your apartment burned after. Yeah, that came later. Oh, all right. I was hoping he could confirm that this is supposed to be Marilyn Monroe's dress, correct? Well, Maria bought it at, a, at an auction, you know, film auction. Was she pissed off that auction. it got burned? She wasn't happy. <laughs> all right, so talk, all right, this is another one I thought would jog your memory about Los Angeles. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's Cherry. Yeah. So I was so shocked when I found out that she had a, an identical twin sister. I, I can't believe there are two of them. <laughs> My, uh. Where is this in Los Angeles that no. you took this? No, oh. that's in that, that same. That looks like in an RV or something. That's the same RV that the shot of Joan is in. Oh, yeah. is this? Oh, is this that's from in Boston? Yeah. It Where did that go? My I was in Boston. I was more organized. But that shot yesterday. was used in the movie Foxes. It's on her mom's bedside table. Ah. So I was proud of that. Oh, so it's the same, that's why you thought yeah, it was same, in the... same We moment. were trying to figure out if this was in a van or a backstage or whatever, but... So what, do you have any stories about Sherry? Hurry. The Sherry? Sherry? You know, I was always really drawn to Joan. I thought she was just phenomenal, a little, a little more understated, but... The, I mean, they were, they were all great, you know? It was, a, it was weird. I mean, my favorite story about the Runaways it's just how much they fucking got slammed by the rock establishment for exactly what they would be now found charming for, you know? I mean, for being young and exuberant. And that was like, no, 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 bad thing. You can't do that in rock. It wasn't that the same for you? They wore corsets. Yeah, well, so didn't you get the same criticism, though? Did I what? Get the same criticism for being overtly sexy or young, you know? Yes, I mean, you know, sexism has changed. <laughs> this is another photo that I love because I want you to tell the story of what. <clears throat> yeah. Actually, you know, I saw some I saw some crazy movie on the other night, and I think Blackie was in it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Was was. So, isn't that Blackie? Yeah. yeah. So that's at the Tropicana, and we we knew Blackie from you know the scene, hanging out. And one day he showed up with this kid, and he said, that's my son, Anthony. And that was, you know, that was that. And I thought they looked really cool, so I shot a roll of film of them. And I don't know if that was the same moment that Anthony proposed to Debbie. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> now that's the story I like. I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> I, I got very turned on, actually. Don't, don't. But he was so young. And yeah, I don't go him. there. <laughs> <laughs> but he was like banging Blackie's girlfriends and smoking weed and the whole nine yards. What? You know, so he, had a, he had a misspent oh. youth. Oh. So, what, so give me a good Los Angeles story. I told you today to think of like what, was there any like really like insane shit that you know, happened. The best there. thing was we were in the whiskey. I think Debbie covers this in the book. Um, we were in the whiskey upstairs with the Ramones, and I don't know if we were playing with them. We did shows with them, perhaps. And Malcolm McLaren was there, and Malcolm McLaren is, was a very snarky guy, just generally. And he made some little remark to the person he was with, some quip. And jo Johnny Ramone heard this, you know, overheard what he was saying. I didn't really hear what, exactly what he said. And Johnny got really outraged and picked up his blue Mose right guitar and started swinging at Malcolm's head. And Malcolm, and I 
totally watch this scene go down of Johnny swinging the guitar at Malcolm and Malcolm running out of the dressing room. And it was a great rock and roll moment. <laughs> okay, so um, the other thing that I wanted to, we'll take one of the questions from our special guest question. We have one for, another one from Parker Posey. She gave us a few. Uh, was your dream growing up about the open road and being a free spirit as much as it was about music? Oh, I didn't really, uh, I didn't know anything about the open road. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't really know anything about music either. <laughs> so what were you dreaming about? I really like hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> This is from the internet. Which song, regardless of its popularity, are you and Chris the most proud of? Li live in, oh, I think that's love, in, live in Knoxville? Whatever. And we'll see you in Cincinnati. Okay, whatever. <laughs> which, which song are you the most proud of? Well, we were, you know, we, the rapture thing is, is we call it just for the crossover aspects and being, embraced in that community. We should have the XXL cover, you know, because they sh we were at this, we got invited to this shoot of all the rappers for XXL magazine. Yeah. And I guess like 99 maybe. And they shot it on the same stoop in Harlem where that shot of all the jazz musicians mm -hmm. was taken and Gordon Parks shot the rapper stuff. And it was, a, that was a really nice moment and I felt quite honored to be, you know, asked to do that. So Debbie, what's the one you're the most proud well, of? Well, the bad part of it is, is that I had brought my little dog, Chi Chi, and... Yeah, at, I was holding the dog. At that moment, when he took the shot, when Gordon took the shot, Chris was like this. I'm like looking at the dog. <laughs> so it's, you can see my, the edge of my sunglasses <laughs> and top of my head, but you know, it's okay. But they were... I, I, we Blame it on the we dog. Should the, we should have brought the... Sh Get that in the in the act here. So, but Debbie, is that your most proud? Is that, is that the song? Rapture? Yeah. 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 I feel like I can, you know, I would always be able to do that song. Some of the songs, you know, you just, they feel too, too dated, you know. But Rapture sort of really stands up, and it's, you know, it, it's it's a groundbreaking thing for the rap aspect, but it was also groundbreaking because it uh, had its own music. And up until that time, all the raps were done to tracks and scratching and, and you know turntable turntable stuff. They didn't have their own uh, musical interlude. So this was a, a double, you know, breakthrough for us. And I always feel very okay. Okay. So which song do you hate doing? <laughs> which song do I hate to do? Which song do you really just don't ever want to sing again of yours? I don't know. I probably, I probably quite a few yeah, of them would a cause great embarrassment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, we just don't do them, so you know. <laughs> yeah. Right, you don't have to answer. So no, I, I, I often think about, you know, taking, taking these old things and, you know, screwing around with them. And, um, but it's... It's logistics. It's, it's yeah, it's logistics. Yeah. But it's also hard to get everybody to be on the same page with you. I think, yeah. you know, Chris and I could do that. But it's hard to do it, you know, with, you know, four or five people, you know? Yeah, I, I Who are very know. set in their ways. Yeah. I know, I've been in the room. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, here's a question from the audience. I, this is very organized this time. You, I don't have to run out there and <clears throat> stretch. But, um, okay, what was it like to work with Divine in Hairspray? <laughs> that would be for you, Debbie. It was thrilling, actually, you know, because I'd known Divine for, for a while and, um, you know, been, been to uh, his apartment and, you know, seen him on the street, been to see him in different shows in the city, and then to actually, you know, have scenes. I mean, we didn't have that many scenes together, but... Um, oh, you had a fighting scene. Yes, but, I, you know, it was, it was uh, you know... Um, I don't know, bigger than bigger than life kind of character, I, even as a person. You know, when we used to see him on the street, you know, sort of flowing down the street in his caftans, you know, uh, uptown, midtown, in in his caftans with no hair. 
And uh, I mean, this was early on. And that smooth, sexy voice would come out. What, is, what was his apartment like? Oh, his apartment, that, that was in Baltimore that was, he was living uh, in. I don't know if that was his or if it was a rental or a sublet or whatever, but he had these two, like, oh, the biggest bulldogs I've ever seen. Really? Yeah. And I never knew this, but bulldogs, um, no matter how big they are, can, really, can jump really high. You heard it here. This is your TED talk. <laughs> okay, so I, want, I have a question about hairspray, but we have to watch this first. Pretty good. It's pretty good. So I, I think they... I think I think that's a Brexit metaphor. <laughs> John Waters was always ahead of his yeah. time. What was it like? What did they do to make your head explode? Your wig explode? What, did, your, what? What did they do to? How did that? How did they do that? That's the magic of film. Of Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> it was CG. Um, I don't know how they did it. I guess they had it on wires and yeah, this is wondering. The, you know, foam and they pulled it and yeah. flew it around. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I and can only do so much. I can, <laughs> you did great. You did okay. great. Very convincing. Do you have any other uh, anecdotes from that? From hairspray? Anything funny happened there? Oh, who played the um um oh god, what was her name? The uh, Mabel or whatever her uh, she played the the Yes. Who was that who played that? Ruth Brown. Ruth Brown. Yeah. What was Ruth Brown like? Oh, Ruth Brown was great. When I, I met her at uh, De uh, Dorney Park was the first day of her shooting. Yeah. I think it's still there, actually. Yeah. Oh, really? Dorney Park, yeah. And it's, a, it's a very old uh, amusement park and, and really kind of sweet and wonderful. And um, she showed up and John wanted to wanted her to wear the platinum wig, and she got very uptight about that. She was really, darn, you can't make me wear that. And she didn't, she didn't get it right away, right. Um, but then she warmed to it. Yeah. yeah. And what's he like as a director? John? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> See here? Well, I'd love to work with him again, so, okay. you know, enough said, really. Yeah. He's fantastic. He has vision. <laughs> He's a creative, wonderful, has creative, wonderful vision. And that's, that's, the, that's the heart of it. Well, since we're on films, there's one other I... Yeah, we talked about video drone. We can talk about it again, but we talked about it uh, in some of the other talks. But we didn't talk about um, my life... Oh, shit, sorry. That's video drum. Um, my life without me with Sarah Polly. Yeah. And what was it like to work with Sarah Polly? Because I think she's amazing, actually. She's really a great... Yeah. She's now a director, too. Yes. Yeah, she's, she's dedicated. She's totally dedicated. I was going to say she's dead. I was like... No, no, no. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> she's extremely serious and dedicated to uh, her craft. And what was it like to work with her in this role? Fine. Fine. She just... You know, she was focusing on, on the job, really. And um, she was... Uh, I would say she was, you know, always, you know, working. Mm. Yeah. D d is this a role that you liked? The what? Is this the, a role that you enjoyed doing? The That's mother? not part of the film. Yes, it is. I, I Google. <laughs> I, you, it might have gotten cut, but it's from it. It's very hard. These are the only two photos I could find from that film. Oh. It's really difficult ah, to yeah. find. Yeah. But. Do you know we were on the set of They Live? Of They Live? Yes. 
and which was shot right here downtown. Uh huh. And we were at the, we were in the scene because Meg Foster was our landlord in New York. She lived with Michael O'Keefe. Michael O'Keefe is the guy from Caddyshack, uh-uh. who was the caddy, and then we also was on Homeland. So they were hooked up, and they, she was technically our landlord in Manhattan. So that's how we wound up on the set of They Live, and we watched the scene where she shoots his buddy, whose name I should know, but I don't. And um, that was it. And I insulted John Carpenter partially. Cause How did you insult John Carpenter? I, I said, you know, you should put the soundtrack out on a record. He said, I put every soundtrack out on a record. So I, don't, I said, I don't know. Yeah. It was, it was hard well, actually, to, wait. It was oh, hard no. to tell if he was really I'm thinking insulting. of Blade Runner. You were, suppo- you were originally up for the part that Daryl Hannah got. I, you know, I wonder about that. I... I you know, I think that I was, and I, I think I met Ridley. Well, we got the script. Time. I had, I yeah. totally remember getting, yeah. I totally remember getting the script. But you know how those things go. I mean, you know, it's sort of, it's a negotiation. Uh, it was said that your manager of the time did well, not. Well, yeah, think there was that too. There was, bad, yeah, it was bad, bad intel. Well, that, what, uh, who was the manager that you? Uh, who's, who was the manager at that point? Who's what? Who was the manager at that point? Uh, is it, what's his name? The, uh, yeah, Leeds. It was, was it Leeds? No. Oh. no, it was Shep. Shep. Yeah. Oh. Shep yeah. Was Okay. <laughs> we won't go down that road. No, but I mean, back I could. To this, back to this with Sarah Pauly. Yeah. You know, uh, is, Isabel uh, Poisset was the uh, director. She was from uh, Barcelona. And she's terrific. She, she makes great movies. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great film. You're really great in that film. Um, okay, let's just like for no other reason go into, um, I want to talk about this. So this is in the book, and it's funny because, sorry, technical. Um, this is your father. Is that my dad? That's your dad in my front dad. of the outdoor barbecue thing. The, the fireplace. The fireplace yeah. that mm-hmm. Debbie, when she was a very young child, would get mathematical equations would come through it, correct? I guess. <laughs> I felt like there was, there, was, there was something that I should remember, you know, that, that somehow there was, and, but it was way up above my head that I, I, you know, I couldn't possibly figure it out, but I thought maybe I would just remember it because, you know, it was so, so cool and so important to know, um, but I couldn't remember. I mean, I used to get them from the static of the TV. Oh, That's yeah. where I would get it. Not a fireplace. Was it outside. a visual thing? A no, mm, little bit, but mostly, you know, whatever. I didn't remember what it was either. <laughs> but, so you, did, you, did that happen all the time, or how many times? A lot? Primarily, uh, the one that the most memorable one was just really one time. OK. So the other one, this, we're going to get into some from the book. Um, this is you and your sister. This is yeah, Martha. Martha. And what's funny is when I, um, when I was getting images for the book and Debbie let me look through her private collection and everything, th- th- there's a moment where all the photos of you kind of stop. Like there's all these pictures of you when you're like, you know, uh, I don't know, up to about here and then Martha comes in and then it's like kind of stops. And I don't, in the book you say you didn't like having your picture taken at a certain point. Probably. You just were like, didn't. I don't know, it, maybe the, the fascination wore off, I don't know, you know? Maybe the camera broke. <laughs> I don't know. You know it, was, it was just interesting. What happens? Then there's this amazing photo that's of you and your, your parents. And um, I just find this so odd and strange. I mean, I mean, I know the photographer's probably like doing something artsy, but it's so haunting and beautiful. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you were like, what? Do you remember You're weird, this? Rob. You're I'm totally weird. weird, but so are you. That's why we get along. <laughs> but do you remember this at all? No. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I I knew we had it. I I don't remember specifically shooting it. I think I must have been pretty young then. Yeah, it's so funny that you can really tell it's you from the. Uh, totally. Yeah, totally. That's <laughs> totally. Um, okay, then let's get then when you met this guy. Yeah. So the, the, this is her favorite picture of them, by the way. She had it in a frame, and I gingerly took it out to scan it for the book. But um, do you, what do you remember about this time, Chris? Uh, selfie. Oh, it's a selfie. See, they invented selfies, too. <laughs> Little known fact. 
Again, TED Talk. Yeah, and also Polaroid. <laughs> um, so what, uh, what was the, diff the biggest difference between like the West Coast punk scene and the East Coast punk scene, in your opinion? Well, you know, when we first came to the whiskey, yeah, this, the, like the, the, we were in there like, I think it was like two nights maybe before we played, and there was a party for this band called the Hollywood Stars. And the Hollywood Stars had like long hair and scarves and bell bottoms and vests and all that, you know, it was very like that reality. And it, and it was kind of, you know, it was kind of symbolic to me because I, I don't know if I recognized it then, but I realized in retrospect that it was kind of the old guard disappearing. And they kind of, you know, reanimated themselves, those types later in the hair bands, you know, in the 80s. Mm. But so we started playing and kids would show up dressed like the Hollywood stars. And then like within a week of us being there, they would all show up with the little ties and tight pants and leather jackets and stuff. So, you know, I, it was gratifying that we had a hand in the uh, alterations in style here, you know. Do you think you're asking if whether it was a musical difference? Yes. Or, well, anything, really. I just wanted to know what, was there rivalry? Was there, I mean, what was X, were you friends with X? No. Later not, on. Later, that yes. was later. Later yeah. on, yeah. Yes. There were, you know, we, there was still a lot of the glam rock going on here, you know, um, that extended into the new wave or punk scene. It was just a, a rolled out a little bit, you know, afterwards, and, and we ended up doing a, a couple of songs by from the Nerves. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, exactly. you know, it, it, <coughs> I don't Excuse know me. if there really was like a, I don't know if there really was that kind of um, contest between East and West. Was it competitive at CBGB's though? Or is it like, who was the most competitive? Yeah, no, well it was really, yeah, CBGB's once the records started showing up in contracts, everybody got kind of cutthroat about it, you know. Who was the first to get kind of, was the Ramones? Patty, television maybe. Mm. Uh, it was kind of all simultaneous, you know. Mm. Okay, random question from the audience. Why did you decide to keep your collaboration with Laurie Anderson a hidden track on Pollinator? Keep it a what? A, a hidden, hidden track? Was it? I don't I remember. I don't know if it was a hidden track. It just didn't. Tonight. Yeah, no, yeah, that was, that was the other Charlie song. Yeah. Right. Um, don't know why that didn't make the thing. I okay. mean, you know, we're, we're torn about doing albums because like our demographic, all the, Hardcore fans want an album, but albums have, you know, are not the way to go now. You just do a couple of songs and throw them out and see if they stick. But, you know. No, I love that. I love that song, and I love what Lori did. Yeah. It's great. As a matter of fact, I was thinking the other day, of, she did so many layers of tracks. Yeah. Um, that I would like to actually use those in something else. Don't tell. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I, I think it could work, right? We could do that. Hey, I have a tape of... Well, you live in the same building. You could just go knock on her door and ask. Yeah, she comes and goes, yeah. I have, I have a tape of Fripp that he gave me years ago. He said, just do anything do it, with it. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, uh, you've served as... This is for Debbie. Uh, you've served as a muse for artists and photographer, photographers. Who have been some of your muses over the years? Oh. Hmm. I don't know, you know, I, um, well, I guess, you know, I, I sort of went through different stages as a kid, you know, coming up um, at home and sort of secretly listening to the radio late at night, and um, there was a lot of uh, really funky R&B coming out of Newark. And you know the way the radio reception was is that you could only get those stations late at night when when a lot of the other stations went off the air, so that was kind of great. Um, so that that was uh, that was very inspirational to me. That it, that it even existed was enough, really. And um, and then later on, 
for some reason, I started uh, listening to Paul Desmond and some, you know, some of the jazz. I, I think they call it the College of the Pacific. And there was, uh, you know, a bunch of West Coast jazz musicians that I really fell in really crazy for. And then, you know, switched back to, uh, I guess, like Chuck Berry and that kind of, that kind of rock. So the early jazz influence, when you kind of stopped Blondie and then went to work with the jazz passengers for that moment in time, did that all kind of come back for you? Did you yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I you know, because Roy is very, uh, Roy Nathanson, who's, you know, sort of the leader of the jazz passengers, is very, uh, oh, I don't know, you know, he knows everything about about his craft and about the, you know the jazz world and all the musicians and so we we would have little conversations about different influences and stuff. His stories about you know his father he said his father was in uh, swing bands you know he he knew how to you know swing and um, but the, it's really hard to swing. I mean it has a different meaning now, but. Um, <laughs> Now it's easy. Now it's easy. <laughs> they have apps for that. <laughs> okay, so speaking of artists, I thought we'd get into Warhol again. So what happened um, last night, I'm getting confused where we've been. Someone asked me a question in the lobby to ask you, and I asked you backstage, but you didn't know. But in the Warhol diaries, this is the proof. It's Saturday, December 20th, 1980. Vincent was having a party, so I cabbed there. I can't do a, I do a terrible Andy accent. It turned out to be a really great party. I was taking pictures of this handsome kid I thought was a model. And then I was embarrassed because it turned out to be John John Kennedy. Fred bought him and Mary Richardson. And Chris Makos was there taking party pictures. And Debbie Harry gave me a present. And she said to open it up when, and she said to open it up and I said no, that I would wait till I got home. And I'm glad that I did, because I just don't know what it is. It's a black thing. I wonder if it's a cock ring, because it's, a, it's rubber and it has a stick on it. But it has this one piece that doesn't make sense. <laughs> you don't remember what it is? I don't think it's real. I mean, I, I just don't you think have he's, a clue. You don't think have he, a clue. He, do you think he made it up? You think he's just hallucinating? I... I you know, the diaries. I mean, he are, had to write the books. Maybe what, what he just was like, be? this might have happened, this uh, might have happened. No, I, I believe it could have happened, but who knows what, what that is about. I wouldn't have given him a cock ring. <laughs> Why not? I mean, I don't think it was a cock ring. I, I, I mean, knowing you, it's probably some sort of like. African artifact thing that you thought he'd think was cool or something. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It's probably something that had, you know, had some kind of continuity with something we had been talking about, and, and it was, you know, kind of funny. And I thought, now I can't remember. Do you think he made it up? I made it up? Or no, him. him. No, I, I Do you think not. he'd like... He, was, he kept notes as he was going along. Oh, he so. did? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well... Well, it kind of reminds me of this question. We have another fun from Rebecca Hall, the actor. Uh, Michael Gambone, who I don't know this is an actor, once told me that he always lies to journalists, just makes stuff up to keep them on their toes. How do you reconcile your public persona with your private life? Is it possible to be entirely real in the public's imagination? <clears throat> well, no, because everything is open to interpretation and words, you know, have, you know, shades of meaning for everyone. Um, and, the, the, I mean, the basic truth is, I mean, it, it's, in the, it's in the eye of the beholder, so it's always interpretive. Um, have you blatantly lied in an interview just to, for the fuck of <laughs> <laughs> I lied! <laughs> it's She's not lie. a natural blonde! <laughs> It, you know, memory is just subjective. Anyway, I frequently have people telling me something that That's happened what I'm to say. that I know didn't happen. 
because I had somebody came up to me and gave me this whole detailed story about how I had Andy Warhol Brillo boxes in my old loft. And I never fucking had Andy Warhol <laughs> Brillo boxes. You know? Yeah, and everything probably, else. Yeah, maybe. But, yeah. <laughs> or there was the drugs. Okay, so let's try another. Oh, Animatronics asked, this is from the Scissor Sisters. This is a really good question for Hollywood. Um, old Hollywood and classic cinema has been a touchstone of your imagery throughout your career. What film would you love to live in? Whose world would you personally like to visit or inhabit? Well, it's not old Hollywood, but yeah. it's... El it's... Topo, maybe? El Topo? Yeah, for what? Me, would, El I'll, Topo? I'll go with El Topo. Yeah, but that's not old Hollywood. Yeah, I know. No. I would, uh, Juliet of the Spirits. Oh, yeah. Fellini. I'd live in a Fellini yeah. movie. For sure. That's a good uh, That's a good question, good answer. I, I like that one. The Godfather oh, come on. If I How didn't... can you choose? Yeah. Yeah. There's no, so that's, many. That's Fellini, I'd, I'd probably want to live that's, there, too. That's... But if you didn't get strangled, you could deal with The Godfather, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go, let's, uh, moving on. Um, have you all looked at the book? Yeah, do, do you like the book? <laughs> <laughs> so, in the book, is the, Debbie said to me, I have all this fan art I want to do something with, so we were, you know, she pulled it out of different drawers and, I don't know, everywhere. And we made this gallery, and we t realized that it's like kind of based upon these, you know, famous, Photos. Oh, that's fun to do. Why isn't it going back? Shit, sorry. <laughs> it's supposed to go back and forth. That one. <laughs> that one is... I um, love them all. Yeah. No, she really does. I mean, they're so... Some of them are so demented, honestly. It's like, it's, it's incredible. It's kind of like having... Do you feel like when people give you bizarre versions of your face that it's like a like a psychology test or something like <laughs> yeah yeah, I, yeah that's what i thought do you have one that in your mind you like or that haunted you maybe one haunted of, you. of the fan art yeah i mean it's not all here but no it's not all there no but is there one that you can remember i mean where's that one like this is like you and where is it you combined with like stevie nicks where is it there that's like, that's like Debbie Stevie Nicks, kind of, <laughs> in my opinion. But are there any that, like, have you found? Yes, I, I, yeah, I can't even think of what it is because it, I don't know if it's in, actually in the book or you mm. haven't been showing it in, yeah. in the series. You mean Which the one, one that gets old? The one that gets old? Yeah, that you have in the attic, you know? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't let me take a picture of that one. <laughs> that would explain a lot. No, but I, there's this one, one person. Uh, that's, yeah. that's one of yours. This one's actually based on a photo I took. <laughs> but it's backwards, so I think they did it in a mirror or something. I don't know. It's pretty funny. I like the ones that are like uh, mosaic things. Yeah. And uh, there's uh, one guy, I think he's from out here, maybe not, um, that gave me all of these... Um, pieces of tile, you know, little pieces of tile and glass. Yeah, uh, that's in the book, actually. Yeah, yeah that one made in the so book. They're so insane. A mosaic yeah. of your face. This one is made of uh, Metro cards. That, it's anyone, people from New York will get this. At the bottom it says, if you see something, say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> that was a detail I didn't know. Oh yeah, that's what that's based on. Um, oh, Glastonbury. This is kind of cool. How did you, what was this? Like. Glastonbury. Yeah. Yeah. We did that twice. I think it's the second time. Yeah, that's yeah. the second time. Oh, you've done. Oh, you've done it twice. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, and they what's that? They said it was like. the biggest crowd they had on Friday afternoon or whatever it was. For you. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, playing in front of a hundred thousand people is. Um, that's the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> you mean to die in front I don't of? Wanna, <laughs> I don't want to die. <laughs> I was there. Um, okay, let's talk about. So, what about um, more Los Angeles stories? You know, somebody who got in a, who killed who? Who got in a fight? Come on, Los someone. Angeles. Well, jeez. <laughs> Didn't you tell me something? God, the other night. Um, shit. Now, now my brain's going. Um, well, we had that gig. You know, we had 
when we first came out here, we stayed over at, uh, I think it was Bel Air, Bel -Air Sands. Sands. Which is all the way which down. I don't think on, exists anymore. No, it's something else. It's on the other side of uh, <coughs> the highway when you it's go right down by, Sunset. What's that round building at the end of Sunset? Yeah. That is? is that it's the like 405 right over there? Everything is the 405 here. <laughs> We're from New York. <laughs> so you cross over. My wife is texting me, like, how's the 405? <laughs> but well, yeah. anyway, we were staying at this. Uh, my, our manager had a deal. Oh, because the guy. Wait, what? they had a deal. Let me. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> we're on the tour bus. They had, a, they had a deal, and that we could stay there for free. But then we had to do a show on a yacht Cat, on, on a big, Catalina. On uh, Catalina. No, no, it was on a boat. No, it was. I swear. No, it, it started out. It was on a boat. <laughs> it was on a boat. It, was, uh, it may have. It may have gotten, because they wouldn't let us do it on Catalina. That's my, that's Yes, and I then they it. put it onto a boat, but the boat was condemned. <laughs> so we didn't have to do the show because the boat was condemned, but the guy had been sort of screwed out of all of this, all of us staying in this ho motel, hotel, yeah, motel. I mean, for of, free. It was, it was kind of Bates Motel. I mean, it was no fancy ass. No, thing. no, it was under construction. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to look for another, uh, oh, uh, this is from uh, Alberta, Canada. Your show here in July was wonderful. Thank you. My question is, what do you do to ca take care of yourself both mentally and physically when you're on the road? I think it's mezcal, but that's <laughs> right. If anyone asks me, I would tell them. There's uh. nothing. There's nothing. Nothing helps. <laughs> You've tried it all. Yeah. I mean, it's just what it is. I mean, it's, you know, lo the logistics are much better now. The, there's an industry that surrounds touring. It used to be really, it was really fucking rough in the 70s, you know, just getting from place to place and be having equipment that you were dragging with you and all this stuff. But uh, it's still, you know, I mean, fucking Billie Eilish. Did you see her tour schedule? I mean, I don't know if I could handle that if I was 17. She's 12. Man. She's 17. Yeah, I know. I'm, that's my point. I don't know if I could handle that even if I was 17. Well, what is her tour schedule like? Like every continent, you know, and then they, they keep booking extra shows on her and stuff like that. Maybe so. she's a, um, a hologram. Yeah. And she's in only one, seven places yeah, at we once. We discussed this last night. Now, yeah, I'm yeah. waiting for the Android thing. i rather the Android two-pack than the hologram two-pack. Uh, you know, it seems a little more solid. <laughs> Until it yeah. starts freaking out. Um, oh, Danny Miller from Surfboard. You are so powerful and bold and a glowing human. What's your best advice on how to embrace yourself and be confident? <laughs> Can I have that mic? <laughs> you want this one? Hello, hello. Is this on? Yeah. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> she's, she's my mic tester. Uh, I don't know, Danny. Danny. I don't, what is that, que is that a question? Yes, the question is, what, what's your best advice on how to embrace yourself and be confident? I don't think she has the, a problem with that yeah, at is. all. <laughs> <laughs> And there's your answer. <laughs> oh, I saw that one. <laughs> okay, sorry, there was another one here. Okay. So let's do another one for the audience. Okay. If you could sing a duet with any singer, living or dead, which would be interesting to do with a dead person, who would it be and what song would you sing? Oh. You said the other night the the one of the shows that you resonated with you the most was Nina Simone. Oh, yeah. Well, that's who just popped into my head. But didn't you do, like, you did a thing with Jose Carreras, right? We were in fucking Monaco, you remember? Yes. Yeah. Wait, what? Yeah, I she sang did with an opera singer. Oh. It was one, so one embarrassing. Of the, was one of the four tenors, you know? <laughs> How, do, a duet? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a duet? I don't know. I can't remember it either. But Wait, Pavarotti who? No. 
Carrera. Oh. Yeah. Was the, you know, one of the three tenors. You know? uh, was it three tenors or four tenors? Well, no, there were three. Okay, yeah. Well, there were four when you were there, yeah. Debbie. <laughs> anyway, you know, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, thrilling, I mean, to hear this kind of, you know, voice come out. We had Chubby Checker jump on stage with us one time. Yeah. And we did the twist. Yeah. That was, uh, oh yeah, that like was some with, state uh, fair or what's something. His, what's her name? The gossip was, was on that show. Oh, okay. Remember? Beth. Yeah. <laughs> Beth, I love Beth. Now there's a voice. Did you, yeah. who? Beth. Oh, Beth, yeah, ditto, yeah. She's the best. Yeah. She's amazing. And you, well, you sang with her. I did. Yeah, on the, what album was that? Can't Don't remember. ask me. Okay. <laughs> did you? There's one before the last one. Okay. Debbie is the only... Rose, a rose by any name. Debbie is the only female on a Ramones record. Singing which, which song? On the Go Little Camaro Go. Go Little Camaro Go, which is my car. Yeah. That's right. I had a Camaro. Ah. Yeah. Were you singing back up on it? Or, or you just, is it, I don't know. I guess I was on. singing Go Little Camaro Go. Oh, okay. And Debbie and Grace Jones sang back up for Lou Reed on... Walk yeah, we found that out last walk, night. Was that yeah, we found out that her, Debbie and Grace side. Jones sang back up for Lou Reed. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Little known fact. Yeah. Okay, here's a question. <laughs> this is so dumb, but I love it. <clears throat> Did you consult on the movie CBGB? Did you feel it accurately captured Blondie's early days? <laughs> <laughs> no. no. So what I thought was going to happen. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Uh, um, oh. How hard was it to have a relationship during your medi meteor me meteoric? meteoric? Meteoric, thank you, rise as a musical and cultural icon. Do you mean with Both him? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whoever yeah, you're no, thinking I, of. You can answer that. I think it totally helped and took a a lot of the stress out of the equation, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. we had each other's backs, as, she says, as one says, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, she always says that you kept her sane by your sense yeah, of humor. Yeah, vice versa, you know? Your dark, mm. weird, twisted sense of humor. Yes, I try. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if there's another good. Uh, well, what did I do for you? <laughs> you, you, you helped out. <laughs> Okay, what are some of the strangest places you've ever performed in? Uh, I mean, that's a pretty Bethesda long list. Fountain in Central Park. Okay. We well, played in the fucking fountain. Oh, that's pretty good, okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, the bull ring. The bull rings in Spain. Yeah. And they, With the bulls in them? No, they, <clears throat> but there was like blood. The bulls blood. were there. But yeah? they were, there was like blood, blood. and shit. It was, yeah. A lot of blood. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> they, you know... And the bull rings were all made of metal. So the acoustics were the worst, I think the worst I've ever experienced. Yeah. Because they were round and they were, had an, yeah, yeah, uh, like an ten, arched roof and roofs. they were metal. Okay, why were you performing in a bull ring? That's what one does in Spain, I guess. I don't know, yeah. I guess because someone paid you yeah, to I do it. With that Canadian, that crazy Canadian. Which, oh, oh, what's Celine Dion? Who Brian are you? <laughs> Who? Brian Adams. Who? Brian Adams. Oh, Brian Adams. Adams. Oh, okay. He's crazy? No. Oh. <laughs> no, he's wonderful. I love him. I was actually thinking the only thing I experienced with you guys that was kind of weird was um, What's Her Name's Party in Scotland. Um, oh, At her yeah. cast. Uh, Roland. Oh, yeah. No, we played for Rowling. Rowling. Uh, yeah, I mean, J.K. Rowling. Yeah, you Rowling. were at that. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah, they played a private party for J.K. Rowling. And, and there was a fucking Emma thing jumped up on stage, and yeah. it was amazing, you know? It was crazy. It was weird, too. Um, okay. Yeah, Emma was dressed as Wonder Woman. It was Halloween-ish, right? Yeah. yeah, it was like a Halloween. She, and we, I remember us driving to the moors, and there was a, the, a full moon so big, I was like, she's so fucking rich, she bought the perfect moon yeah. <laughs> for tonight. God. Um, is it true you're making a new album? Of, uh, is it a follow-up to Pollinator? Are there collaborations? Inevitably, there'll be some kind of collaboration, yeah. even if it's just between me and Chris. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah no, we were, we're in the in the process, uh, very elementary stages. Yeah, of it's all it's always going on. Putting of, the pieces know. together yeah. and thinking, thinking about it. Well, you're always scribbling. Yeah, I, I scribble. I She's mean, always like. It's so <laughs> embarrassing when I look back at the scribbling. It's tragic, really. <laughs> So self-deprecating. And, and we really love John Congleton, you know, we have a, that was a great choice. Yeah, you know, John Congleton. He's our, here, here. He's our producer, you know, most, mostly known for St. Vincent's. He might have, they, they he's won, done a lot, but St. Vincent they, they was... They won a Grammy or two or something, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, <clears throat> this one's kind of, I don't know, let's just try it. I was a fan of Blondie before Parallel Lines was released. I had both prior albums, Blondie and Plastic Letters. When I first heard Heart of Glass on Parallel Lines, I thought it was intended as something of a parody of disco. Of course, it was so successful, it became one of the most famous and long-lasting disco songs. Was Heart of Glass intended as a parody? No, I don't think so. I didn't think so, yeah. No, we really, we really thought, as I've said many times, that we were referencing Kraftwerk. Yeah. And <laughs> that, you know, it, but it, <laughs> somehow s slotted into the disco world. Uh. And it was a weird crossover, because remember we like did a couple of these gigs at these you know, disco emporiums, and they would like the one song and then be just like, the rest of the stuff was like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But you worked with Giorgio Remoter after. Yeah, that was after, yeah. <coughs> but did you kind of, it was uh, like, uh, you do, when they sing Heart of Glass in the live shows, you do a little bit of I Feel Love yeah. comes in. It's really amazing. But <clears throat> is that something that was inspiring? Did it, that inspire you for Heart of Glass? Or you just because it was two disco anthems? You no. Did that? no. Heart of Glass existed probably at the same time, germinated actually at the same time as I Feel Love. Really? Completely separately, because Giorgio said he had it in the, you know, sort of in the back burner for about five years. And so did we. Hard yeah. Glass was around for yeah, five you years. Know, I, I mean, it really kind of came out of like Rock the Boat Baby, you know, that song, which I should, I should know who did that, but I don't at the moment. Thank you. It always sounds like a flock of birds when people like, <laughs> like, what, what, what? Um, so then this one, this is a kind of cool thing that I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. I was like, it's a fucked up contact sheet. But um, I, Debbie has this, the, in her collection, these contact sheets from the Hunter Sessions, and they were all destroyed or damaged in a flood in Chris's basement, basement at one point. And I thought it was kind of symbolic and amazing, so we kept them as in. There's this little cutout in the, if you can see it, in the, <clears throat> the left-hand side. And uh, we just put a drawing in there of a, kind of an androgynous person because you were always saying how the two of you together are one perfect person. Mm -hmm. So what, at this time, do you remember, what, what's, what was this time about? Were you like over it? Or were you just, in the Hunter, like just, I guess this would be, the album would be done. You'd be doing the shoot, the photo shoot for it. I know, you know, it, our, our system sort of lacked um, it was like all these tentacles that, with, with no head. Well, like that's support. I mean, we were, the, you know, there wasn't a lot of emotional support, certainly. Yeah, I mean, it could Not, take a turn in any direction at any time. You know, sometimes you'd be going along, and then boom, go that way, and boom, back the other way. So it, it was never really sort of a steady, uh, steadying influence, which management. Uh, logically would, you know, su supply or, you know. Provide. Yeah. So who was the manager so that, that didn't happen. at this point? Is this Leeds? No. Oh. <laughs> well, why, I, how come Peter Leeds, he, Leeds he was, was terrible only, too, was right? only on at the very beginning. Leeds was only yeah. manager briefly and kind of hustled us. And he was awful too? Yeah, he was not a good guy. <laughs> he was a bad guy. Yeah. He's Nick. no Tommy Mansey, yeah. who we should give it up for your, your current uh, manager who helps make all of this happen. Tireless. The, but yeah, it's Tommy Mansey who's like kind of incredible. Yes. He, he's, he's like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> Never stops. But you know, it, it, so were you feeling sick at this time? Is this when you started to feel ill? No, I, I might have been a little later. Later? After the record period. 
All right, let's move on to happier times. Jackie, 60. Okay, so oh, we have yeah. some, are there New Yorkers ever? Any Anybody ex here? Yeah. So Jackie, 60 was Tuesday nights. Uh, also, we should say, oh, that's what I wanted to do. If you all turn to page, because I don't have it in the, ah. if you turn to page 284, you will see a picture of Michael Schmidt and Debbie in the infamous double-sided double razor blade dress. And he's here tonight, yes, yeah. correct? Ah, there's, there's Schmitty. So Debbie was talking about it the other night, and she said, someone was like, well, what was the worst thing about you know, the dress? She's like, getting in and getting out. <laughs> But um, tell me more about that. Who, did he come to you with that idea? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And w was it for something specific? Uh, I, was it? No, I don't know if it was anything specific. Yeah. Um, you just said I want to. it was wanna... just a great idea. Yeah. And I, I love the idea. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was also, the reason I bring it up is because it's kind of simultaneous two clubs at the same time where Jackie 60 and Squeezebox was on Fridays. And um, what were the, what, those are the two clubs you really yes. frequented the most. Yeah. And what was it about <coughs> either of them that you loved the most? If you could, Dancing. Yeah. Dancing and, and great music and wonderful, you know, great people and, you know, a, a, certain, yeah, a certain kind of madness and, you know, great, you know, great club, club life. Do you remember a Jackie Six? But I want to say something more about the razor blade dress. Yeah. I don't know if I ever told Michael this. I played... Um, a track date in New Orleans one year um, for New Year's Eve, and um, you know everybody's out in the street going wild and in the clubs going wild, and so I was up on this runway doing a, doing a song I don't remember which song, um, and suddenly everything went pitch black. No, you know the electricity blew out <coughs> for the whole town, for the whole city, and so I was standing there in the razor blade dress. And all of a sudden, I felt all of these hands <laughs> slithering up the dress. Wow. Yeah. And was it Satan? It, no. <laughs> it wasn't Satan. It was people that were really tripped out. But none of them, have, none of them got caught. I mean, cut. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I they, caught them. Yeah, you caught them, but they didn't but get cut. They didn't get cut. Wow. No, no that was a very strange. Uh, and then do you remember when you um, dressed as a priest and sang Maria <laughs> 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 for the Christmas show at Jackie 60? No. <laughs> no it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Harry. Um, let's go into, okay. This I look is, good as a boy. You do, you're actually quite handsome. I mean, I have to, I have to say, yeah. Well, you're always saying that you have the brain of a man, correct? Or yeah, I, so I used to think I did, but now I don't. Okay. <laughs> TED Talk. Um, and let's talk about, for the hell of it, Lady Bunny. Lady Bunny. So what, when did you first meet Bunny? Gee, I don't know. A long time ago. Yeah? Yeah. And what, what was your... Well, I, I think I probably saw Bunny in, in performance before uh -huh. I actually met her. Because I, I, I didn't... I didn't know Guy at that at that point either. Mm. I think Michael Michael introduced me to Guy. Mm. Really? We uh, yeah right? Is that right, Michael? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Didn't you say there was a story once that I always for some reason remember that Bunny was out of drag on like the street and you saw her and she, something about the garbage. She was like, What was she doing? <laughs> You gonna make me rat her out? Yeah, why not? <laughs> We're in LA. What, I don't know what she was doing. I thought she said she was like, she saw you and then she went into the garbage and started <laughs> on the street and went, <laughs> and then you walked away. She's <laughs> very apropos, honestly, for, for Bunny. <laughs> but um, in New York, we had a special guest of uh, Fab Five Freddy. He came live, it was great. Um, but he was, he told a really great story about the first time that he heard his name checked, Rapture, mm -hmm. and he thought it was a, a He's joke. another one who thought, he it, thought was it was a joke. joke. Well, he he thought was thought like, it was it's a, really good, but... It's just he thought it was just a demo tape. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah it's a good, good bit. And then he was in Paris in a taxi with Chris and Tina from the Talking Heads, and he heard the song on the radio, 
And he said, how did this guy get this tape? You know? (laughs) (laughs) It's pretty funny. But you know, speaking of jazz, you know, Freddie's uncle is Max Roach. So Freddie grew up in a jazz family. And, you know, that was part of his connection. Okay, so then the other one I thought we'd talk about is like, there's a poem in the book called Rush of Souls that Debbie wrote after 9-11, like, because of it or, or affected by mm. it. Yeah. Um, and what, so, I mean, I, we always talk about this time, how it's such a turning point in New York. And so what, your poem, like, what did you, did it just come to you really fast or did you kind of take your time with it or in pieces? I, I worked on it a bit, it, but it, I mean, pretty much thematically, the whole thing was there. But, um, you know, I had to, you know, clean it up and do that kind of stuff. But the whole, the whole, uh, I don't know, the whole environment, the thing that was so stunning to me about this uh, 9-11 thing was that the day before 9-10, I was driving into the city, and it was one of those clear blue sky, sparkling day, perfect weather. And that night, Mark Jacobs was having uh, a big, big party. It was the launch of his perfume. Yes, yeah. And it was down on one of the piers on the Hudson. And it, you know, I, I don't know how many thousands of people came. I mean, it was just a okay. traditional old style New York party. And uh, it, it was fabulous. And I, I was just feeling so great. Wow, this is New York. This is, you know, this is what it should be. And then the next day was the end. It was like, that was the party. That was the end. Yeah, that's this. how I felt. I was at that party with you. It was the same feeling. Yeah, it was yeah. kind of like, oh, it's all going to be totally different Totally now. different, yeah. Yeah, it's never going to be the same. But you also drove in that day and oh, yeah. tell that story. That's kind of spooky. I was driving in the set day, and I, I looked across the, the Hudson. There's this one point where you come up, and you can see the whole island, and, you know, it's spectacular. Um, and I looked at the Twin Towers, and I thought, oh, I should get a picture of those before they're gone. Not good. Well, you've always been, I mean, as long as I've known you, you have like a, I don't know if it's a psychic ability, but there's a, you're a, you're a sensual person. Yeah. I think that's how, especially in the book, when you read about your childhood too, I was like, oh yeah, it's very, you're a very sens- sensual being. I think you absorb a lot more than most. I mean, maybe most artists do. I don't know. What do you think? Are you more unique in that? I way? wish that I, you know, I think I should be more sensitive, actually. Yeah, but sensitive is different than uh, sensual, I think. I mm. think, like, I don't know, sensitive makes you sound like you have to be <coughs> sympathetic. Nicer. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to be nicer. You don't have to be nicer. <laughs> if you were just a little nicer, maybe you'd be more successful. <laughs> But, <laughs> no, I mean, do you, you, you both, you talk about how you've had a kind of a psychic yeah, connection had, yeah, to Debbie but, that but, you've had. You know, I've come from an old witch family, so. Oh. Yeah. No, yes, I'm making that up. Yes, he's Transylvanian. Yeah, well, you know. yeah. He is. You're Transylvanian? Uh, well, Romanian and Russian. Oh, okay. But, so the dude behind the guy in the white shirt who's looking at the camera, kind of, I was just at Morrison Gallery like two weeks ago, and they said, this guy showed up. And his name is Walter, I didn't get the last name, and he's thinking about buying a print of the picture, and he only saw the picture this year. But that was like right in front of my loft, yeah. where, I, where I was down on Greenwich Street. Yeah. And you, mo- you moved out, you and Barbara, your wife, left well, the Well, we had been looking, you know, but that yeah. was kind of the clinic. It was, most, it was also because like, fucking rent went up. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, if there was anything that I was completely, I mean, I'm wrong about a lot of shit, but it, that was when I thought, oh, the city's going to be, the only upside is it's going to get cheaper, and art is, <laughs> total opposite. So let, let me say one more thing, is that a lot of those guys wouldn't have died if they didn't have those shit radios, and that's on that motherfucking Giuliani, man. He, you know, and he, you know. Well, he, he took a lot of credit for this, and he, it should have been the opposite. Everyone's know? like, this whole Giuliani thing, like, what happened to him? Like, he was always an asshole. Yeah. 
Always. And now he's kind of like, in a weird way, he's getting this kind of karmic bite in the ass by being a crazy old man on TV. Yeah. But that's not good enough for him. Um, is there anything? So we're kind of coming towards the... Let's see if there's one more. There was a good one. There was one that I thought was kind of a... Uh, no. <laughs> um, we talked about that. Where was that one? Okay, this is kind of dumb. CBGBs or Studio 54? Well, we were, I don't know, I wasn't at Studio 54 that much. I was there, you know, a handful of times, really. Yeah. I had but some terrible experiences there. At Studio 54? For Wait, example, at Studio 54? Elaborate. I was there once, one night, and um, I don't know, I, I was sort of, you know, talking to this bartender, and um, he kept giving me drinks, and... Um, I got, I mean, I don't think I had more than two drinks. Pretty sure. And, uh, but okay. I mean, I was, uh, I would, he, he gave me something. I was roofied you. Yes, something. Not a roofie, but something like a, I don't know, some kind of really mess, messed me up. And I, I went, I staggered back home to 58th Street, which wasn't, you know, very far from 54th Street, but. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> yeah. And then I got, I, I got in and I, I went up to Steve Sprouse's apartment and I said, Steve, let me in. Just let me in. I, ha I have to go to the bathroom. And so he let me in and he saw, he saw I was, you know, really messed up. And he said, OK, well, just lie down, lie down. So I lied down on his bed and I threw up on his pillow. <laughs> I felt badly. Friends... No, no, I, I still feel badly. <laughs> no, that's what friends are for. Oh. <laughs> it's true. I mean, come well, not every night, but, you know, <laughs> it's happened. Yeah, I've I, done I was it. once at a party, and I passed out with my head in my friend's bass drum, and I threw, <laughs> and I threw up in his bass drum. <laughs> true story. Who, who's the friend? Is he still I, your friend? I can't remember. It was a long, long, long time ago. But we, we, were at, we played at CBGB's every weekend for seven months in a row. So we were definitely there more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I knew that was going to be your answer, but yeah. I didn't, you didn't really go to Studio 54, you said. I was there a bunch of times, but not a lot. She was probably there more. You were there more. She says she was in the basement. I never went in the basement. Yeah. Yes, I was also on the bottom of a pile of people one night. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> Do you know and who I the people were? I remember staggering into, they had phone booths. And I peed in a phone booth. <laughs> that could be your segue into hanging on the telephone. <laughs> um, um, I right, might well, like doing the song if that was the case. <clears throat> yeah. Never, never mind. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Is there anything that you uh, we I asked this at the first night that doing this memoir? Yeah. Is there anything that you rediscovered about yourself that you were really surprised about that you just because if you hadn't done the memoir, you wouldn't maybe wouldn't have thought about it? No, it just gave, it gave me a better sense of organization and you know sort of a, a good kind of perspective and to sort of let up on myself, you know, because I you know, tend to sort of get, yeah, and uh, no, I said, you know, man, that's, that's a lot. So and was it freeing in a way? Yes, to totally. And I'd also like to add the uh, little, you know, thing about talking with Sylvie Simmons. You know, she, she and I did a lot of lengthy phone conversations and interviews, and that's what this, you know, whole book is based on. And um, it just, you know, sort of grew out of that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of don't want to be introspective, you know, about my life. You know, it's sort of, I'm much more interested in moving forward, and I mean, you can't sort of bury the past, but you know, you don't have to carry it around, you know, and live with it every single day. Um, so in a, in a way, this really put me in a better sense of balance about everything. 
And Do you feel I just I'm I, never speaking to you ever again. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I know. We have to tomorrow, but it's we okay. Have yeah. to, right. no, it's okay. <laughs> After that. Psh. Do you ha but are you when you looked back on it all, were you did you have any sense of pride? Do you, do, were you proud of when you looked I'm back? I'm amazed, what, mostly. Amazed? Yeah. yeah. Of course I'm proud. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. You said it. She said it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that you were, were toward coming to the end of our presentation? Is there any, we should get a better picture, though. But <laughs> like not... Let's not leave on that note. Let's leave on, um, let's pick a good, oh, your favorite picture of you two. That's a good one. Ah, yeah. Is there anything that you want to, you know, say, leave the, the audience with a tidbit or some oh sort of? Oh my God. Yeah, follow me on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. um, well, yeah. It's, yeah, so follow, go ahead. Yeah, Insta Instagram I'm a little more covered, but that, I do a lot of really great photographs on Instagram. And, but Twitter, I get to say all my, you know, you can see my political views. No, his Twitter feed is really kind of amazing. You should definitely follow. Yeah. Debbie doesn't do it so much. She just causes tw uh, Twitter storms and trends. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, uh, I just hope that we can all survive what's going on and, and yeah. ma maintain yeah. our... Well, thank you all so much for coming tonight. I hope you enjoyed the book, and I hope it was entertaining.